Welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. Check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so excited to present two books on climate change tonight. First, we'll hear from Linton Smith and Stephen Collis. Then they'll be in conversation with each other. A few years ago, Andrew Snare Magnuson, one of Iceland's most beloved writers and public intellectuals, was challenged by a climate scientist if you cannot understand our scientific findings and present them in an emotional, psychological, poetic, or mythological context, then no one will really understand the issue and the world will end. Based on interviews with leading scientists and interwoven with personal, historical, and mythological stories, Magnuson's On Time and Water is a response to this imperative. We're fortunate to have the book's translator, Lytton Smith, with us tonight. Lytton Smith's translations have been twice finalists for the Best Translated Book Award in the United States, a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Translation Fellowship recipient. He lives in Western New York where he teaches at SUNY Geneseo and directs the Center for Integrative Learning. Stephen Collis's A History of the Theories of Rain explores the strange effect our current sense of impending doom has on our relation to time how do we go on with our daily lives while a disastrous future impinges upon every moment? Collis's book probes our current state of anxiety with care, humor, and an unflinching gaze into the darkness we have gathered around ourselves. Stephen Collis is the author of a dozen books of poetry and prose, including the Commons, the BC Book Prize winning On the Material, Once in Blockadia, and Almost Islands. In 2019, he was awarded the Latner Writers Trust of Canada Poetry Prize in recognition of his body of work. A History of the Theories of Rain was published in 2021. He teaches poetry and poetics at Simon Fraser University. And now I'll turn it over to Lytton Smith. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the interest, Dan. Thank you to Writers and Books for, um, for hosting us. And um, it's a delight to, to be here, not only to talk about um, uh, this book, which is you know a really important book at this moment in um, in time, but um, uh, also delighted to be reading with Steve, whose work I've been reading for for quite some time now with with much admiration. So to get to share a platform uh, is is a, is a delight too. Um, uh, I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from Andrew's book. Um, uh, I almost tempted to read the sort of the, the COVID postscript to the book and read the very last words of the book and 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 in, it decided to go a slightly different direction. But um, uh, but a, there is an awesome COVID postscript as well, which I wanted to to flag up. And um, so I'm just reading from a chapter called "Farewell to the White Giants." In the future, glaciers will be an alien phenomenon, rare as a Bengal tiger. Having lived in the time of the white giants, will become swaddled in a fairy tale glow, like having stroked a dragon or handled the eggs of the great orc. Glaciers will certainly be found in the Arctic, Greenland, and Antarctica for a few thousand more years, but probably not in the Alps and the Andes. They will disappear in most parts of the Himalayas and Iceland. People will ask, how were glaciers described at the beginning? People will ask, how were glaciers described at the beginning of the 21st century? I was not as familiar with glaciers as my grandparents were. I'd seen them from afar and had gone up to Snifelsjokl in winter, but winter glaciers are nothing like summer glaciers and outlet glaciers are quite different from an ice sheet or a minor glacier. And so we planned to cross Skaderajokl, where it heads south from Vatnajokl, one of its major valley glaciers. It was the end of July 2012. All the winter snow had melted and all the cracks and shapes in the ice were as clear as they would get. This was actually our second assault on the glacier. A few years earlier, we'd headed up there in pouring rain and pitched our tents on a low gravel bed. When we woke up in the morning, pools and springs had formed under the campsite. It was almost as if someone had struck the ground with a magic wand, causing water to well up out of little bulging eyes. People woke drenched in deep puddles, and so we turned back home. Now, the plan was to camp at the edge of the glacier, fairly high up, and cross the glacier in one long day trip, a total of about 25 kilometers. 
And then we would camp on a green terrace, one of the most beautiful campsites in the country, and make a long, another long day trip into Skafterfeld National Park. We woke up in crappy weather. The tent was shaking in the wind. It was warm down inside our sleeping bags, but shiveringly cold once we crawled out of them. We packed up quickly and set off in spite of the poor visibility. At the edge of the glacier, we ran into some hikers um, who had crossed the glacier during the night. These were a French father and son and the father's friend. They were cold and dazed, almost in shock after the night's hardships. They had lost their way and come across a crevasse that could not be traversed. It led them astray so that they ended up too low down where they got into a maze of deadly deep crevasses. And so they went back and forth blindly in the fog and rain and darkness. 10 hours of walking became uh, 20 hours. They feared for their lives and pitched tent as soon as they stepped off the ice, bone tired and relieved they had reached safety. We ourselves tramped through slushy mud at the glacier's edge where glacier meets land. We tried to avoid the quicksand that forms when melting glacier ice seeps water into the sediment. The glacier was black with sand for the first part of our journey, and on the ice we could make out strange objects, flat stones on thin ice pillars, like works of art made by aliens. The weather was slowly clearing until we started to see before us an endless breadth of tussocks, as though innumerable white turtle shells stretched out as far as the eye could see. We saw that in the middle of the mountain slope on each side of the glacier was a light stripe that marked its surface level as it had been just a few years ago. In many places, high up in the cirques, we could discern so-called dead ice, flows still hanging there in the rock after the surface had subsided. It tests every sense of one's brain to imagine a glacier surface 30 meters above one's height, the height of a 10-story building, extending it in the mind, as though it's a vaulted ceiling over the entire expanse, reaching one edge of the glacier to the other and a whole kilometer out onto the sand. Our path continued, and now it was if each of the tussocks were individual scales, with the outlet glacier the tail of a white dragon. We came upon something that resembled a black sand pyramid, and then more pyramids gradually appeared until we reached an entire forest of black pyramids in the middle of the glacier. The evaporation from the sand cones emitted fog veils. Little streams trickled between them, creating a micro landscape, almost like a bonsai landscape, little mountains and little rivers and little towns, and we were mesmerized by the shape and the beauty. Between the pyramids, streams ran like little water slides. It was tempting to take a ride, but if we followed them, we'd end up in a glacial hole. These gullets were white holes that became blue holes and black holes that extended as much as 300 meters down to the bottom. It was vital to take special care around them. The thought of losing one's footing and disappearing down into a hole was the stuff of nightmares. The only parallel my mind could conjure was the sand pit in Star Wars where the gigantic worm-like sarlacc lived. In the book Solaris by Stanislaw Lem, astronauts float behind a mysterious planet and try to figure out its nature. They hypothesize that the planet has some kind of self-awareness beyond what the human mind can comprehend. On the surface of the planet is a kind of ocean of yellow foam that takes on familiar shapes the astronauts try to interpret and understand. They wonder if the planet is sending them messages. I tried to interpret the glacier's shapes, the pyramid forest opening out into a streak on the surface that resembled a two lane highway. In the middle of the road was a black line as if to mark the lanes. The surface was smooth and level. One could have driven at 70 miles an hour as far as the eye could see. I involuntarily looked both ways as I walked across the road and wondered if the glacier was giving me a single maybe signal. Maybe it was telling me that somewhere between the pyramids and the motorways, something had gone wrong. I lay down on the cold ice and put my ear to a narrow crevasse that seemed a whole eternity deep, though only a few inches wide. The ice in the wound was as clear as crystal. I looked at the veins and bubbles in the body of the glacier, which created a strange three-dimensional feeling. I heard how the water gushed far down in the quivering space like a dark base, water dancing somewhere deep down at the bottom, like a giant xylophone, a rock harp, an ice harp the glacier's swan song. Now that the glacier is changing faster than ever before, I feel myself within a paradox. My being on the glacier comes from advances and technologies, the production and mass extraction of Earth's resources. By the time humans were able to cross glaciers, to count the nesting places of crocodiles and to study the song of the humpback whales, we'd grown so strong and expanded so far that what we were finally able to measure and understand had already started disappearing. 
In documentaries, melting glaciers are a dramatic spectacle. Gigantic ice chunks crash and rumble as they carve into the sea. But a dying glacier is actually no more dramatic than the normal changes of the spring season. Ice melts in the heat and the sun, forming streams that frolic and splash. In fact, a dying glacier is more a sad, frail sight, disappearing quietly. You could call the situation Silent Spring, had Rachel Carson not already used that phrase to title her book on how insecticides affect nature. And after spring will come summer, the long global summer. The place names on Vatna Yokel store memories of the changing environment. Breidamurkasanda, meaning wide forest sand, recalls a forest there before it became a black sand desert. Under the sand, we can find the thick stumps of 3000 year old birch trees from a time when the local Nordic climate was warmer or as warm as it has become today. The wide forest turned into a wide desert after the advance of glaciers in the little ice age. The self-sowing birch is beginning to breed itself once more. Breidamurkasanda will probably become a wide forest once again. And on Skedera Sanders' endless stretch of black sand, the largest self-contained birch forest in Iceland is beginning to form. Could you really call the largest forest in Iceland Skedera Sander, Oat River Sand? The forest would be named after a vanished glacial river, after black sand deep under the forest floor. Ice, gravel and sand emerge from under the glacier, a new land that has been frozen for hundreds of years. At the glacier's edge, you have to tread carefully on the ground. It's as if the land is neither ice, nor water, nor sand, but all three at once. The transformation has an intermediate step, chaos, as in the prophetic medieval poem Vulaspa about the beginning of creation. The sun knew not where her hall stood. The moon, moon knew not how mighty it was. The stars knew not their stations. Chaos is not confined to the glacier's edge. No one knows how the land will lie when our way of life has caused the world's glaciers to become water, our coastlines to become sea, and our arable fields to become deserts. When I turn 90, I will show my 30-year-old grandchild pictures of Skederjökull on a projector screen. They'll see a glacier that three generations of my family had the opportunity to get to know before it vanished. When I take a photo of a glacier, it's like I'm recording and preserving an old woman singing an ancient lullaby. After a thousand years, people will peer at the pictures like rare ancient manuscripts and try to understand what we were thinking. Thank you, and over to Steve. Thanks, Lytton. That, that was really wonderful. I, I kind of want you to go on and just keep enjoying listening. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Dan and Writers and Books for hosting us. Um, I'm coming to you tonight from the traditional and ancestral territory of the Tuasan people south of Vancouver in what is commonly known as Canada. <laughs> um, I'm going to read from the new book and I, I was going to start from the beginning and read some of this and I'm still going to read some of this um, kind of difficult to read I think prose section um, for a variety of reasons. But as I'm listening to Lytton, I get other ideas, which almost always happens when someone reads before you. So I might change my mind a little bit as we go along here. Um, so this is a book working through my climate grief, I guess you could say. But it's also a book where um, I'm trying to explore one of the ontological qualities, I guess, of the Anthropocene. And that's the kind of skewed and uh, disorienting relation to temporality. Um, that it provokes, which is a, you know, a theme I really find in uh, On Time and Water as well. Okay. Give me music, because I never could understand its direct connection to that feeling stream, squall and water clock, washing ideas right out of me, taking up the mechanisms of consanguinity, rushing toward last light over Pacific, and some seabird there, gliding and catching moonlight, same as struck only dinosaurs to have survived the last collapse of intricate order. Winging now into night as the cellos soar and the possibility of song remains without words to smother it. I need glasses. I, I, I read that from memory probably more than anything else. Couldn't see it very well. Um, this section is uh, kind of a prose introduction or prose poem to the, at the beginning of the book called Future Imperfect. So what will happen between this unusually warm November and an unspecified but nearing future when it will have warmed however many degrees Celsius above the present stretching global mean, asking for a friend? I feel tense. Give me a 
tense, such as actions that will be completed before some other event in the future. Plot a line, A, present, to B, future, and place the future perfect somewhere between those points, but who knows what ontological status B has now is the problem. If we don't know where we are going, how will we know when we've gone too far? Hashtag capitalism. To make our future perfect, there must be a deadline we work toward now to then, the breach coming between we choose. I choose you. I choose all of you. Let's do this now and then. Say, we will have always have been living in the future like this. Say, we will have always been pondering the course of history unfolding. Say, our descendants will always have been thinking, what were they thinking when thinking about us in those thoughtful days to come? But the future, the future is imperfect and tense. The deadlines will pass, and still some will be dreaming states of continuity. I want to state some continuity. Look at the climate and say, my grammar did this to me. My grammar and my economy. Mostly, I look quickly at the latest reports through the cracks between my fingers, out the corner of my eye, look away quickly, calculate years to collapse. A, grass dies. B, human beings die. C, human beings are grass. It's years, right? Rolling fields of us all relative, the wind bending the blades back before the dawn, all in the same direction, rippling wave and particle, dying in drought, coming back green in spring rain, the colors. We forget the colors of the grasses, their flowers, lead, purple, pewter, scarlet, like a fever, so small yet so very many. The detail is lost in the collective sheen. Intercalary meristem, spiralet movement. We're all relative, relatives. That was then, this is now. The plow is in the sky. The earth is tilled by no one. A, all civilizations collapse. B, you call this a civilization? It will always uninterruptedly be so. It will always be that it will be that P, possibly so. True now or in some possible futures. I like possible futures. Suppose P to be true in some possible future only and Q in some other possible future only. We will then have both P and Q in their two futures, but never now nor in any possible future do we have P either accompanied or followed by Q. I think this is logic. Even if P is a restabilized climate and Q is runaway warming, a time series in which there are alternate possible immediate futures, but only one ultimate future is what I fear or long for. I don't know. This is logic. I am an animal fretting. I think gore is what we went toward. From a thing's being the case, it necessary, necessarily follows that it has always been the case or has never been going to be the case. This is the logic of futurity. What will always be already is. Here is our hope or our despair. Logic doesn't tell us which. Which reminds me, human or animal? Both, of course, migrants of all species coursing through these lines to mark and to count time out of time, at a beetle's speed, a goldfinch's, a Sitka spruces, where M is moving north, will be moving, will have come to have moved north over formerly bordered terrain. Can you walk away from a climate? 17 kilometers north by land, 72 by sea per year. In the future, everyone will have their 15 minutes of blame. There's some doubt as to whether we'll ever be able to say, remember climate change? And then just leaping a little bit ahead uh, to catch the glaciers as they recede and, and think about time in a slightly different way. When, or is it where, did we cross the border, one regime of time into another? 
or is regime too academic? I mean, you went outside one day, will have done so lately and much too soon. And instead of open temporal track to contemplate, path led instead right off the edge of map, here be monsters. And even if two roads diverged, they both still fell off the edge of the time it takes to climb out on the ledge, times arrows pierced you upon. That's what I mean by a regime. Some forces we find difficult to explain structured our feelings, gathered in our city squares near clock towers, chanting forever chanting for the end of the regime, cool cyclical time to touch us like a once familiar breeze from outside where zeros taught us phosphorus. That's Emily Dickinson. But I was saying something about the border. Time of tightenings, cinched limits, right when it was a climate of movement once again, all transhumance, routes and ranges removed and like steerage passengers locked below Titanic deck, if that story is true, probably is. Coming up from south, structurally adjusted and thinking, you came this way first, hombre. Hurricane wiping island clean, drought and freshly imported gangs or janjaweed. Tell us the truth. The border is the scaffold we made this mess upon. And when the news is bad for birds, and there's a border even they can't cross, then it's time we learn to like the fire by playing glaciers. That's Emily Dickinson again. <laughs> I would love to know what Emily Dickinson thought about glaciers. I, I think maybe there's like a, I've got a, a, a one minute left to squeak in one last little poem to end upon, because this will allow me to end with dinosaurs and songs, which is where I began 10 minutes ago or so. So here we go. Then I'll go to form and to lift. Some words falling together from out what's left have to have fallen from out what's left no matter how meager, no matter how bereft, in the age of endarkenment, not much is left. And we were a scourge and we were beloved and we sang as we killed our way across. Remember the seasons? Remember the beach? I stood up to go with the mountains. Who knew the mountains would leave here too? I think swifts don't need to land on tiny feet to hear the opening notes of a new symphony soaring. Then the seas joined in, pulses and seabirds too. All birds were once seabirds, though we don't know if dinosaurs sang songs too. Thank you, everybody. That was fantastic, Steve. That was just, uh, yeah. And, and um, I, I too now, I'm just wondering, though, like, yeah. I, and maybe you know this, right? Every reference that Dickinson makes to glaciers, right? What, what would that produce? There's definitely a, a, a like a like like Dickinson sat in on science lectures um, at the college in Amherst as a you know a young woman probably in her late teens early twenties because her her father was like a chancellor of the little college in town and women weren't allowed to go to school there but she sat in on lectures and she writes notes about attending science classes you know basically you know, biology geology so she, she loved that language definitely uh, drew it into her poetry quite frequently. Yeah, so I'm, I, 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 this I did not know, and now I, I want to go back to to Dickinson with my, you know, with the with the science lens. Um, um, you got to uh, go to the the what do you call it? The concordance. You got to go to yep. the concordance and then root around. Absolutely. <laughs> so we've got time to talk, and 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 and, and yeah. we want to say, you know, um, uh, you know, Steve and I can chat, and we were chatting about pubs and all sorts of things, but you know, <laughs> we'd we'd love to hear you know questions and thoughts from folks, and you know, in the chat. So please don't be shy if you have something to you know, to ask. Um, uh, I wanted to get the ball in while, rolling while we we're sort of waiting for that, Steve. And, and um, uh, one of the things that's, that's so powerful for me about this book, and, and, and you know, it, it's obviously comes from, you know, the, the, the trajectory your work's been on, but is reminding us about the stakes of the border here, right? I mean, you talk about the economy at one point, but you're also talking about sort of the politics of re regimes. And so we, when we think of climate change, we sometimes just think about, say, weather or sea acidification. But in a book of poems you get us so far into thinking about the the politics i just wonder if you you'd feel like talking a little bit about that as part of your project 
So much to say, isn't there? I mean, uh, one thing in, in, in the passages you read from, um, from Magnuson, uh, it really struck me is, is uh, the, the, the way the imagination is drawn on, upon, especially in the discourse around climate change, you know, uh, imagining the absent glacier or imagining that future moment when, when the glacier is gone, it might still be hanging on now and you're having to tell your kids or your grandchildren about blah, blah, blah. That imaginary is, is really powerful in climate change. Um, discourse. And, you know, of course, borders are absolutely imaginary. Uh, the idea of a climate tipping point, that other kind of line that I'm really fascinated by in, 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 this, in my book too. Um, the, the, again, these um, imaginary complexes that, that have, but have real consequences. And we're really struggling right now, I think, to think the future. I mean, obviously there are real co climate consequences right now in, in, in the present and have been going on for decades that we can notice. But, but the real uh, horror or the real rubber hitting the road or whatever the right expression is, is still kind of in the future. It might not be very far in the future, but it's still just ahead of us. And that constant uh, demand to, to imagine what is coming, that's a lot of the discourse around um, displaced people and human movement and refugees right now too, right? I mean, there's a steady um, uh, movement of, of, of displaced people um, generally moving from south toward the north for obvious reasons. Uh, both to do with co um, colonialism, but also to do with climate. But by every report and estimation of the experts who's, who we think know, um, it's, it's of the massive uh, um, amount of that is still to come. So it's really time to start thinking about how we're going to um, imagine a world in which people can move, where people are, are free to move and free to remain. And because uh, uh, that's going to come lockstep with climate climate change. Uh, of course, states are, are prepping for it already. That's why there are so many borders and walls being built and borders being militarized and rigidified and because they know it's coming too. Yeah. yeah. I know you've got lots to say about this too. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 sure. And, you know, and, and, and I think the, and it's interesting because it, you know, one of the challenges of reading for Andrew's amazing book is that, um, you know, for po folks who don't know about it, you know, he, this, interviews with the Dalai Lama and the, his um, grandparents founded the Iceland Glaciological Society and one of his grandparents operates on Oppenheimer and you have all of these things coming together but one of the profound connections is that you at first you, it sort of seems like well what are the Himalayas doing here what's the Dalai Lama doing here is this just the chance of an interesting life and and, and actually Andrew weaves in very interestingly that the interconnectedness of, of things which and I think so the militarization of, of borders is clearly working to try and you know keep us separate from, from one another. And, and, and then there's that really interesting moment in your poems where you're thinking about birds not being able to cross a border. So it's the borders become so effective, even though it's a different border that the, the birds can't cross. And Andrea, I think is tapping into, yes, the glaciers in, in Tibet are gonna be very different from the Icelandic ones, but the politics of what happens when you start diverting river sources because of a scarcity of glacial water, you know, that, that's going to affect the whole world order. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The other thing about that part about the glaciers um, in On Time and Water that was really fascinating, and you read it so, so wonderfully. You really brought the, the rich language of this text. So there's a whole question I'd love to ask about translation. Maybe, maybe we'll get there, though. Um, but that glacier section, you know, it's, it's so much about imagining the changing shape of the world. And, and often catastrophe and disaster is, is all about that, all about changing the shape, you know, like a, um, um, the... the uh, why can't I think of the famous church in Paris right now? <laughs> no, with Notre Dame, right? Notre Dame burning, yep. right? And and part of the the horror is is you know a, an image like that church is so embedded in many people's imaginations and imagination of a Western sense of culture and history and blah blah blah. And for it to you know it's not totally erased, but still the that skyline change. I had the exact same reaction on nine eleven. Um, you know, all those years ago, I had to teach a class on American literature that morning that it happened and got to my classroom and said, um, the shape of the world changed today. And that's the first thing I thought of was just the shape, you know, it was so iconic, New York skyline. Um, these, these, these moments of, of uh, uh, change in our imagination of space, imagination of the world are so affecting. Yeah. It's just, we don't see glaciers <laughs> in the way we see those buildings say, um, riddled throughout our pop culture and our daily consciousness. 
we need yeah, to. that's, you know, one of the things, I mean, that the photo in my background and, and, and part of the story of how I got to translate on, on Time and Water has to do with, with the fact that I've had the, the, the privilege of taking uh, students from Sunni Genesee across to Iceland for some Australia abroad on a couple of occasions. And, and I get to co-teach a course with the geologist Nick Warner, who researches Mars landing sites in Iceland, because that's where, where one does that on, on this earth. And, and um, you know, I've, I've told the story a number of times, but it, it, him sort of saying to me that sort of becoming a geologist is learning to see the landscape differently because time moves differently, right? You're looking at the landscape and seeing it sort of unfolding over hundreds of thousands of years. And I think, you know, if we could imagine more the, the time to come, right? The tents that you're talking about in your poems and, and the glacier that's missing, um, uh, you know, then, then then we might be better at dealing with with this crisis, right? So it's partly a failure of the imagination. Um, yeah, yeah. We've got a couple of questions in the in the Q and A. Um, okay. So Barbara first, which is, have you read Nature's Best Hope? Right? Is it just too small a, a view? Now that's on my once I finish with the grading and 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 the early admin tasks of the summer. That's on my my to read list. I don't know if, if you've come across this that, Steve, yet. Whose or... books is that? Is that? Um, um, I'm trying, I'm trying, I was, I, I knew, I, this is, this is the Zoom, re if it wasn't a Zoom reading, I would feel no worry about like, ah, I'll have to look that up later, now I'm on Zoom, I'm like, I need to drive the spaceship and look that up, um, uh, and I can't remember the author's name right now, but um, that's definitely, you know. I heard the title, so I, I'm sure it's, uh, yeah, is it, is it McKibben or something, it's like, it's, it's like a, 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 I think it's one of those big climatey books, like I've kind of seen that title go by, I just can't remember, yeah. off. but I haven't read it yet, no. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's, you know, and I think that's, you know, I like this word hope. I mean, maybe one thing we'll get back to, you know, before we run out of time is, is, is optimism, right? So that, that, that's a word to have here. Okay. And then a question from, from Ileana, which is, um, how has being a writer changed how you perceive the world and communicate these perceptions? Do you want to handle that one first and then I'll come to it? Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's such a tough one because I feel like I've, I've uh, learned to perceive the world via being a writer like, like there's no pre um perception of the world I can I can recall you know you, you start sometimes you just start thinking you're a writer and trying to write from so early and it becomes a, a focused practice of perception for sure so I guess it has changed how I perceive the world but it feels a little more like it's 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 absolutely shaped and made how I perceive the world um so and and you know that then gets bound up with being um uh, I guess I'll say being an academic, <laughs> it's a terrible word sometimes, but you know, so you, you, you want to see and, and grasp the particular in front of you, but you also want to see pattern and structure uh, that things build into and try and see those two scales at once and be able to move between the scales. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's a very good answer to that question. Lit Litton, help me out. <laughs> no, it's a great, it's a great answer. And, and, um, and, and I think, you know, that does, you know, that pull to to sort of close read and to theorize that that, that sort of academia is, is both, you know, like, you know, sitting in committee meetings where you're wrangling over a single word, right? But also sort of thinking about sort of the the, the these wider moving forces. Um, and yeah, Douglas Tallamy for Nature's Best Hope. Um, um, uh, so um, I just put a link in the in the chat for everyone. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I, I think, you know, part of the question also about sort of writing and perception, I mean, I think poetry, I think, comes into it. And we, we've spent a long time in in a lot of um, uh, maybe a lot of Anglophone cultures. Right. I don't want to sort of speak for spaces like Australia and New Zealand, but certainly in the UK and the US sort of signaling the death of poetry, which is. Um, you know, we had some students here several years ago who produced a, a badge and a T-shirt, which sort of said, if, if you keep needing to say that poetry's dead, then it must be sort of doing pretty OK. Right. You know, like because it's, yeah. you know, it clearly isn't. But but I think that the, the ways that poetry might try and sort of crystallize, but also open space, it, it goes hand in hand. Um, it's been interesting with this book because I, I think of myself as an Icelandic translator. I'm a poet. When I work with prose, it tends to be coming out of Icelandic. and and then I've become, you know, I can't say a climate change writer because I'm a translator, but I, I was writing sentences in English in response to Andrews. And, and so I was learning as a reader, right? And so sometimes I feel maybe close to people who are coming to these kinds of books for the first time because it wasn't as if I knew all of this and then found a book to translate. It was sort of, you know, drinking my cans of seltzer while reading about the problem of aluminum smelting in Iceland and wanting to stop drinking my can of soda and, you know, late into the night type moment. So I think translation has a special kind of uh, changing of perception in, in, in that yeah. respect. The other part of this, I guess, is, is the, and, and it touches on the, the, um, 
the much talked about death of poetry too, I guess, but uh, you know, both you and I, Lytton, have, have written poetry that's engaged with uh, contemporary political events, sometimes, you know, often very raging, urgent, <laughs> impassioned, dramatic uh, contemporary political events. And you sort of wonder, well, what's a poem doing here? I mean, it, it's, you know, not going to change the world. It's not going to intervene. I always think, well, you know, if any uh, work of art was actually going to change the world, then you know, it would be some best-selling novel. And there have been best-selling novels addressing pressing social issues and they didn't do it. And, or films, you know, mm -hmm. I, I always bring up Wally. -E. What, what was that film from years ago, which is so, such a dramatic portrayal of ruining the earth. Wally -E didn't change anything. We, we've dumped way more carbon in the atmosphere since Wally. -E. Um, so you, you got to take that, that idea that, oh, I'm writing something that's going to intervene or, you know, change things. You're not. You're trying to think and feel your way through the spaces you're in in the world, and and for some of us, those are necessarily or unavoidably very uh, heightened political spaces and problems we're trying to think our way through. And the poem just happens to be um, how we think. <laughs> I love that answer. Uh, yeah. No. I. I very much. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I you know, I think also, you know, the way that your your poems and, and Andrew's book give it a language, though, right? And and sort of, I mean, there's plenty of you know, state politics is happy to give a language to our experiences in a way that that, that dramatically alters them, and, and maybe in some way, if poetry can reclaim that, that's that's part of the hope. Um, we've got three great questions in the chat. I know we haven't got that long left, but we'll try and get through them. And th this first one definitely is coming to you first because it really starts with you. Although I'll jump in, but Karen Russell says thanks for the wonderful conversation. Um, shout out to Karen, great to see you here. Um, can you tell us why you're drawn to poetry as opposed to essays or other forms to engage with climate change? Um, and is there anything that we too think the language of, about the language of climate change that gets repeated by the media and distorts or conceals from our view? What a great question. Wow. I mean, I definitely uh, was thinking about that coming into tonight in some ways because, you know, um, uh, Magnuson talks about this, I think, really early on. And it just struck me because I was thinking the exact same way when this is on page eight, I think, just of the very first chapter, really an introductory kind of moment where he says, um, when, when a system collapses, language is released from its moorings. Uh, and he goes on to talk about temporality and how difficult that is to think about, you know, these changes surpass any of our previous experiences, surpass most of the language and metaphors we use to navigate our reality. Um, and I, I think poetry has always already been that for me. It's always been that space where, well, I'm a little bit outside of uh, um, direct perception in some ways. I, I'm already beside things. I'm already in a space that, that's kind of been created before I got here. I started reading poetry, thought, oh, wow, this is an amazing way of thinking. I, I to, I'm going to like a cliche phrase, thinking outside the box. <laughs> I really want to say that, but that's kind of what it's like. You're, you're thinking outside of structure so often in poetry. At least that's what contemporary poetry has always been to me. This, this way you can start thinking outside of the, the given structures, thinking differently, um, moving obliquely and tangentially and, and leaping across things. Um, I'm not answering this question, am I? You are, you totally are. And then I think, you know, it's made me think about the way that sort of poetry might rewire yeah. the, you know, the, the brain a little bit and not that prose yeah. cannot, but I think prose, you know, prose does it differently. Yeah, exactly. So the amazing thing is, is that that Magnuson and in your wonderful translation, he does it sets that right at the beginning going this, this boggles, it goes beyond our ability to to put this in words, the problem of climate change. Uh, and he kind of says, well, I'm not going to write about it directly, although you got to a passage he kind of does <laughs> write about directly. But a lot of the early book, which I've only read the, the early part of the book so far, um, it is very indirect and it's wonderfully indirect. It's fascinatingly indirect. So, so I guess, Karen, part of the answer here is that there's no reason not to write uh, essays or memoirs or fiction about climate. Um, although I often find climate novels very unsatisfactory, <laughs> novels, or as novels, maybe. Um, but, but poetry has always been, uh, well, and again, it's a cliche, how, how do you say, uh, speak the unspeakable? Yeah. Uh, and that's climate change is kind of unspeakable and unthinkable, and, but we have to try and think it. And poetry is, for me anyway, a good tool for that. Let and go, I'm talking too much. No, 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 this is, this is great. And then, and then you brought back Emily Dickinson, tell all the truth, but tell it slant, right? And so I think that, which was kind of funny because that's what Andrew's doing in, in, in Time and Water. And so it's, you know, and Andrew's also interesting because he's a, he's a poet 
to begin with. He's a novelist, he's a children's book writer, but um, I, I don't know if, like, I know we've hit eight, ten, and I don't know if Writers and Books lets us continue, but there's some great questions here. So as, as long as we're allowed to keep going, we can go to 8.15, Dan says. We'll try and get through these quickly. These are great questions. Um, Alyssa, I'm wondering what either both of you think about the idea of glaciers as migratory, growing and shrinking, moving across the landscape and perhaps borders. One of Steve's poems juxtaposed birds and the constraints of borders. I'd love to hear you speak more on borders and the natural landscape. Um, and I think that's really pressing in, in Andrew's book. I think that's why he goes to glaciers at one point and he sort of eulogized, you know, the sort of the, the glacier that's disappeared, but that sense that they have carved out lands and have, have, have moved across lands in ways that disregard borders entirely. Um, and, and, and then we, you know, sort of the, the, the fallacy of borders is to try and imagine that they exist. Whereas, you know, imagine if we'd sort of explored territory based on sort of understanding the movement of glaciers rather than sort of arbitrary designations of sovereignty or something. Yeah, yeah. Or any natural markers. And often natural markers are the, the starting point for, for traditional senses of where territories begin and end. Um, but then they get rigidified and abstracted as borders too. Uh, I think that's fascinating. I'm not quite sure what to say about that. Although, what a great idea, the, the glacier as this sort of uh, focusing on its mobility. Um, mm. And of course, its mobility is connected to our mobility. You either uh, can hike across a glacier or it's gone and you can't, or when the glacier is gone, it, it's in the ocean and then the ocean's rising and you're no longer where you were, you're moving from there. There's, there's a real <laughs> connection um, between glaciation and, and, and human mobility, I'm sure. There's a lot you could do with that. Absolutely. Um, th 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 this, we're trying to fit in two more. Uh, Jan says, how do you think you can appeal to those who still deny climate change in your writing? It's a big one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the problem with climate denial is uh, that, I mean, to my mind, that can't be someone who's actually looked at this. <laughs> that, that, that's got to be somebody who started with an ideological blinder up in the first place. That they've, they've heard uh, the, the, the Trumpian whatever, they, they've drank that Kool-Aid. And yeah, the, the, so I don't know how you'd reason with those people. And, and frankly, and ultimately, and like a lot of political things, you don't have to convince everybody. I mean, 75% of us have to get vaccinated, and I think we have herd immunity or something like that, right? So we can allow some people to not, not get vaccinated. We can allow some people to disagree that climate change exists and still do something about it. Mm. We've just got to get the, a, a certain critical mass. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, you know, again, it maybe comes back to the imagination. I don't want to speak for Andre, you know, but the answer I get from him through the book is that it is about trying to sort of understand helping people understand an imaginative sense. And, and in a strange way on Time and Water is a really hopeful book, partly because he tells the story of his, his uncle who saves a crocodile species, which is now named after him. And, and even in that excerpt I read, which is, you know, can, can be quite depressing, but there's that moment about he's still thinking about showing pictures to his 30 year old grandchild. And you think, well, uh, you know, it's about the sort of the imagination of our place in the world. Um, so, um, uh, but we, you know, we don't have to reach everyone either, right? I think there, there are some people who, you know, they have a, a belief system in the world which is an, an observational one, and 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 um, that that they, you know, are, are not necessarily where the conversation goes. Um, question well, from Chloe. Question. Oh, go, go yeah, on. This, this translation question. I can read it for you yeah. now. Okay, you read it. Here. So, question for Lytton on translation when working so intimately with someone's poetry do you feel uh, do you feel you take on some of the personal understanding of relationship to the poet subject in this case climate change glacial uh, spaces etc how was it how has it influenced your relationship to the subject yeah that's a great great question i think you i think you do right i think i mean charles simich called translation the closest possible reading and i think you find yourself in in the headspace of of, of that person to some extent the you know the language as far as you can access it being you know being an outsider to it and and um so um there's a kind of empathy of of, of translation and um um and and that's one of the pleasures but definitely you know it's a very emotional act um and i you know yeah. i often translate at night after the kids have gone to bed and especially translating a book like this and i'm working on, on andrew's sort of prequel to this which is about the aluminum smelting industry and in Iceland and you know it just gets darker and, and closer to midnight or the early hours and you're just thinking the world's going to hell in a handbasket and and you know Andrew was writing years back and we didn't notice and you know back before then um uh so it's definitely it's definitely personalized it um and um yeah but I think that must be true of the poetic process Steve and the research process and just sort of you know and and, and your own translation right of, of, of theories of the history of rain right you're sort of working with source material yeah T translating that weird 
avant-garde way of from within the same language, <laughs> but in translating nonetheless. I think we're out of time. We are out of time. Uh, this is this has been great, and I see there's more um, in the chat, and 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 wow. John and 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 Cam Stram, um, with um, with great questions and observations. So I wish we had even longer, um, and and hopefully we'll find people around. But um, I, I want to plug Steve's amazing book and, 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 and plug Andrew's amazing book and plug writers and books as a place you can get them. And uh, uh, you have to hold your book up too, Steve. I haven't got my props to hand. I'm, I'm a bad. There we go. Fantastic. Um, but yeah, if people can support writers and books, support um, Talon Books Open Letter, we'd be super grateful. And thank you, Dan, Dan for hosting us. And thanks, Lytton. Yeah, and thanks, Dan. That was really great. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you both for being here. This is wonderful uh, reading and discussion. Uh, I want to thank our funders and everyone for coming by the books at Ampersand Books. The links in the chat. Uh, if you can, uh, if you want, you can catch up with our previous readings and including this one uh, at our website wab.org. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks everybody. All right, have a good night.